Um, so I just wanted to uh, start from where Panagiota left us. Uh, thank you, first of all, to, um, to all of you, our uh, dear colleagues in, in Dreft and in the Netherlands for, um, for framing, for intellectually framing, logistically organizing the, the webinar and, um, and having us be part of it. Uh, it's always really fantastic and a great honor to be able to share the work with you. Um, so my talk is going to focus or zoom in more on the issue of urban green inequalities, trying to move us from uh, green gentrification, which Panagiota already introduced a little bit, to urban green justice and how to maybe move us closer to this. I have a lot of slides, but I'll just go very quickly through them and I'm happy to share um, a PDF of it if it can be of help um, in the future. Um, the place on our uh, web platform where we most share in a brief way, in a more um, disseminatory way, the findings from our research is our blog on green inequality. So I just invite you to have a look at it if you want to follow some of our uh, most recent findings and also just see some recaps of the articles we have published. Um, Okay, so the main argument that I wanted to frame today, which is a bit of a summary of our um, entire research on green gentrification, has to do with green Lulus, playing a bet on the word Lulu, which is a locally unwanted land use in the planning literature, and basically arguing that a different uh, range of green infrastructure in global cities or in globalizing cities is being associated with being a green Lulu, meaning a green locally and wanted land use in racially mixed and working class neighborhoods because of the types of environmental health and climate uh, inequalities that um, many of those infrastructure tend to, um, to reproduce or exacerbate. Uh, this means that the way in which residents of vulnerable backgrounds are being excluded calls for new emancipatory greening uh, practices, which I'll talk a little bit about towards the end of the presentation. So let's move us, let's say theoretically or conceptually from green privilege to environmental and climate uh, gentrification. So from an environmental justice standpoint, the vast majority of the literature in environmental justice tells us that if you are, for example, in the United States, African-American or Latino, you tend to live in communities with less park space per capita and especially large amount of park space or quality park space in comparison with white or um, Asian residents. And that has huge impacts from a health standpoint because high residential exposure is associated to green space, sorry, is associated with a lower risk of mortality. You avoid death by uh, being close, uh, closely located to a green space. And if you move beyond, let's say, those historic inequalities that exist by race, by class, by ethnicity, um, in relationship to your access to green space, if you move beyond this, you also see in the literature that there is an increasing um, unequal movement of access to green space that is produced by processes of creating new green spaces in cities that leads to the displacement or exclusion of the most uh, economically vulnerable groups, which uh, Sarah Dooling described as environmental gentrification in 2009. So you have a lot of cities that are branding themselves, that are articulating um, agendas and um, interventions that are linked to public green spaces, but the way that those are embedded into processes of unequal uh, urban revitalization, those that Panagiota was describing earlier, creates new inequalities through, um, through displacement. An example, that um, I like to bring in is the Parc Extraordinaire, the extraordinary park in Nantes, which is this massive former quarry that the city is now transforming into this Jardin Extraordinaire, this new emblematic green space that uh, the city of Nantes wants to attract, wants to be a place to attract tourists from Japan, for example, from the United States, positioning Nantes as a not only regional metropolis, but global metropolis metropolis, trying to also attract investors, partner uh, investors to 
invest in the park itself and also around the park itself. And so Nantes, in a way, is moving from being a city that really puts social justice at the very center of urban greening, which were the policies of Nantes in the 1990s, to uh, becoming a place that has much more exclusionary um, greening. And Panagiota was describing in our city of Barcelona, where we live, the green city orthodoxy that represents a space like Passage Saint Joan, for example, that has become an excellent opportunity to invest. So how do we measure the scope of green injustice? And let's say in, that, in the talk today, green gentrification in particular. So we've done it through several uh, ways in the lab. And what I would like to emphasize today is that displacement and the dispossession that is associated with it um, or financial, physical, and social cultural. So if you look at the financial aspects, for example, um, in a study that we have conducted and that um, was based on this report that I'm showing here, the Green Trajectories report that we released uh, a few years ago, what you see from those 99 cities that have done extensive green branding that are on these green trajectories is that there's a positive relationship between high levels of green boosterism and high levels of unaffordability, even if you control for population size and economic indicators. A place like Vancouver, for example, is extremely well positioned at the center of those dynamics. It's highly expensive. It is a, um, a city that is really centered around international investment from um, wealthy Asian entrepreneurs in particular, and is green and is very livable at the same time. It's always at the top of livability indicators. And so here, green boosterism is intertwined with urban revitalization that leads to less affordability. From a physical standpoint, how do we measure green gentrification? One, early studies, for example, that we published that my colleague uh, James Connolly published in 2018 was looking at New York City. And so what James showed is that the areas that um, had the highest composite greening score between 1990 and 2014, which are the census tracts that you see in dark gray here, were also those that gentrified the most between 1990 and 2014. So the spatial juxtaposition or even overlap between greening and uh, gentrification. Then that same year, we published a pilot study of Barcelona looking at 18 green spaces that uh, were added to the city um, urban fabric between 1990 and 2006. We looked at the districts that were below uh, median income of the city. And what we showed is that approximately 60% of um, all of those green spaces um, produced a form of green gentrification that was either moderate or, um, or strong. And that this was particularly true for the parks that were along the waterfront, that were in the redeveloped San Martí district, which was also a district that um, was rebranded as a tech, uh, heavy, and as a design and architecture district with a lot of housing stock that could be um, that could be regenerated, and so an area that really uh, where you really saw that green gentrification was boosting those processes of uh, urban changes and unequal urban changes in particular. Uh, then we also did a city of a study, sorry, of DC in the US, where here we were able to introduce um, different types of green spaces in our study, looking at both larger parks and um, gardens, but also community gardens. And the interesting aspect in that study is that, um, so first of all, the changes in non-Hispanic Blacks, so basically Black African-American residents, were the most significant predictor of gentrification associated with green space between 1990 and 2015. And then that the community gardens were the types of green spaces that were most linked to neighborhood social change. So it's not necessarily uh, large parks that play a role in the relationship. It can also be community gardens. And interestingly enough, also if you look at the direction of the relationship, what we saw is that gentrification was predicting actually the creation of green spaces more than the other way around. So if you will, um, gentrifiers coming in and being able through their political power or their use of space to attract greening rather than uh, lower income residents. 
And then the most recent results are those that um, we, we are going to publish hopefully soon, uh, which is the results of our 27 city analysis. Uh, and I want to thank here one of our colleagues, Elsa Galez, who, uh, who I know is in the room and I wasn't um, I didn't know that Elsa would be here and she was very much part of that study as well. And so what you can see here is basically a summary on the left of all cities that are in our sample where you see uh, green gentrification taking place at different moments um, in time. So for example, um, you see sustained green gentrification from the 1990s all the way up to um, the end of the 2000 in places like Vancouver, San Francisco, and Boston. So green space is built in those early year having um, an important um, uh, relationship with gentrification. You also see on, in the very upper left um, cell a process of sustained green gentrification all the way from the 1990s to the 2010 in places like Atlanta or, or Seattle. And then you also see places where um, green gentrification takes place in, in the um, uh, later period only, like in Nantes, for example, this example that uh, I was showing you earlier of a city that moved from social equity between being at the center of greening to now metropolization and um, attraction of talent being at the center of it. And then you also see places where you see sustained green gentrification throughout the entire study period. So the 1990s to the 2010 with an increasing recent trend. And that's our good friend of Barcelona. And when you think about the way in which greening is now performed in the city, you really see the embeddlement um, between or the deep relationship between um, large and small scale infrastructure throughout the entire city and processes uh, of land speculation. But then you also see cities where we do not see any clear indication of green gentrification. And those not only, but tend to be uh, in Europe. And those are the ones um, on the right here. Something to be careful about is that for some of those cities where we see no clear indication of green gentrification, it's also because we do not have uh, sufficient data um, because of the way in which the, um, the demographic data was structured in particular. But here you see cases like Lyon, for example, that has very strong uh, housing policies. You see cases like Valencia, where actually gentrification takes place, but it's not actually through greening. It's much more through large scale redevelopment, um, real estate and cultural uh, projects. And then you also places where it doesn't uh, happen, like in Cleveland, which is a city that has been shrinking economically, population wise since the um, well, since like three decades and hasn't recovered yet. So you do not see this process of uh, green gentrification yet, not even of gentrification per se. And then what our analysis also um, has tried to get at is the role that greening plays in relationship to other factors in gentrification. So for example, um, if you look at DC, Washington DC, greening takes plays a role in explaining gentrification, but it's subsidiary, it's much more marginal. In places like the ones in the center column, it's much more integrated. They are greening, helps to facilitate other drivers of gentrification and other drivers uh, are reinforced by greening. And then you have places where greening is really the lead driver of gentrification. And those are the same places I mentioned earlier, Nantes or Vancouver, or actually our good friend, uh, social equity, supposedly uh, city, Copenhagen, and places where greening has, no, has been known to be at the center of the city identity for years, like Atlanta and Austin, but also has been deeply associated with uh, large scale luxury redevelopment, Atlanta and Austin. Social cultural displacement, and I'll just go very quickly here. In a study that we did in Barcelona, we looked at different types of play green spaces in uh, different areas of the city that were being greened and gentrified at the same time. And what we saw is that uh, many families that were living in more advanced stage gentrification areas like the Ribera neighborhood in the city center had lost a sense of community cohesion a sense of identity, a sense of place attachment because of the ways in which those green spaces were also used by tourism, 
um, for criminal activities and people were feeling pushed away social culturally from using the space. And then there was also this additional pressure of housing um, displacement. And then sometimes you have it all combined. And very briefly, this is what we see in some cases of green climate gentrification, where uh, when you do green climate resilient infrastructure, like in Boston, for example, you see both a form of physical and uh, social cultural uh, displacement, um, which we call again, green climate gentrification, where properties become more exposed to, low income properties become more exposed to flooding. They are not the ones being protected uh, through green resilient infrastructure. Lower income uh, residents do not feel welcomed in resilient parks. There are also deep processes of uh, displacement because of rent hikes in the entire neighborhood. So it's a complete gentrification mess. Um, in, in that part of Boston called um, East Boston. I'll spare you the case of Philadelphia because we don't have time, but I'm happy to talk about it um, in a different moment. All what we also want to highlight here, that's a study that by my colleague Galia Shokri, is that we do not only look at gentrification from the past to now, we also try to predict neighborhood vulnerability to gentrification because of past uh, trends and uh, spatial trends in particular of where gentrification has, um, has taken place before. What are equity-centered alternatives for green and just cities? Just to uh, avoid going into a deep hole of pessimism with our um, presentations. What do we see as models that can give us alternatives? The main argument here is that the policy and planning path toward urban green justice in our views lies in finding the right mix of anti-displacement and equitable green development tools. Meaning you have to do anti-displacement work, pro-housing, pro-housing rights work before greening. And you also have to do a form of greening which is equitable and is uh, more inclusive. Also kind of responding to what Panagiotta was uh, highlighting about the case study she did of Passage uh, San Joan in Barcelona. So we have a report um, that tries to lay out this argument a little bit more, which is the policy and planning tools report for urban green justice, which is also um, on our website, where we looked at 50 different tools. So those that were either anti-displacement, anti-gentrification, and others which were more focused on equitable and green development. Um, trying to think about those tools from both the North American and the European context and the planning conundrums that exist in both spaces. And looking at those tools that you see here on the screen. So some of them are land use tools, for example, inclusionary zoning, uh, community land trust, a moratorium on new businesses, hotels, and hospitality industry permits, regulations on uh, short-term rentals. And all of our tools have a vignette of one or two uh, cities that illustrate um, this tool and that again come from our Green Lulus project. There are also tools that are related to um, requirements imposed upon uh, large scale developers and how um, developers can also contribute to uh, affordable housing. We also have schemes that are aimed at home ownership and equitable home ownership. We have tools that are uh, focused at renters and also financial tools that are focused on the community uh, level. And then just finally, other types of anti-gentrification ordinances or regulations, for example, public workforce housing. If you are a workforce, um, if you're part of the workforce of the city, a teacher, a policeman, a, a nurse, you should also be able to benefit from a type of housing that actually also responds to your salary scale uh, rather than just salary scale of supposing you know, creative industry residents. And then the second type of tool that we have are more like the improved green amenities or open public amenities tools that help towards um, green uh, inclusivity. So for example, the social use of green bonds um, to increase greening projects, the rezoning of unused urban land to green space rather than for example, industry or a commercial, the redevelopment of green space on vacant land um, some regulations that have to do with the, um, with permitting large scale urban agriculture in cities, et cetera, et cetera. So I won't describe them in, at length, 
uh, feel free to, to have a look at them um, on our website. And we're also organizing a webinar on the 14th of um, September uh, at four o'clock Eastern, I'm sorry, European Central Time. So you can also feel free to get in touch with us if you want to be part of that uh, training or exchange webinar. Uh, Nantes, so despite everything, and that's uh, almost where I want to finish, Nantes is an example of a city where greening and social equity has been uh, historically going for and par, both because of the huge emphasis on increasing green space all around the city, having socially oriented eco districts, and also having a land redevelopment mechanism called the ZAC that really controls and, um, and designs neighborhood redevelopment in a way that developers are much more executors of public decisions than developers controlling uh, land redevelopment and oftentimes uh, speculation. Just, just some of the examples of urban greening that is integrated into uh, social housing in the city. Isabel. And then finally, just one or two slides and I'll go very briefly here about what would be more radical green alternatives an alternative for greening that would be much more anti-subordination and, em and emancipatory greening related. So in that sense, a form of greening that focuses much more on other types of injustice we haven't talked as much about, but Panagiota hinted at, which is reparative justice or preventive justice. And that a form of greening that questions experiences of domination, subordination, racial stratification and oppression in space, articulates emancipatory greening, and at the same time helps racialized groups regain access to land, resources, and nature. And land control here is particularly important and should be accomplished through new forms of institutional arrangements. Washington DC is an example of a city that tries to do this a little bit with the 11th Street Bridge, um, 11th Street, uh, Bridge Park project. Uh, it has a wonderful equitable development plan that focuses on training minority ownership of businesses, uh, also of homes, uh, by buying of uh, former properties that were used vacant and transformed into social housing. Uh, but it also has limits, and that's where we call for a different form of uh, land redistribution um, because greening can also, as it is in Washington, D.C., activating the commodification of greenness and diversity. It's fun to be green. Um, it's fun to be diverse. But at the same time, this funness and the commercial insertion of funness and greening together also facilitates a new um, displacement frontier. Isabel, so I'll finish here. Of time, I would like to ask you to and that's it. Yeah. So yes, urban greening and green spaces are vital to climate, ecological, and human health. But we need to move away from the whiteness and exclusion that is often embedded in the green city orthodoxy and uh, decouple greening from decolonial um, and emancipatory practices. Thank you.